My name is Sahil Law. And my name is Caitlin Loft. In the spring of 2018, we enrolled in Introduction to Global Health with Dr. Cynthia Frank, and so did another student named Josiana Mukunde at Aleeks. At the time, none of us knew each other. If this had been a typical class, we may have never known each other, let alone learned, each other's, learned of each other's backgrounds. But this wasn't a typical class. On the first day, we were asked to be vulnerable with one another and to find a common thread in our lives something unique to our group. This was to illustrate that though we may come from different backgrounds, we all share something common, our humanity. This was just the first exercise in vulnerability. Over the course of the semester, we were encouraged to draw upon our own experiences when thinking about global health issues to contextualize them. Few stories stood out amongst others. There's a student who grew up in Pakistan both of whose grandparents passed away due to kidney disease. There's a student who grew up in the United States, but whose parent who had to attend all their parents' medical appointments because they need to act as a language broker. And then there was the refugee. She stood out from the rest. She spoke from experience, from a place of pain and hardship, but also with a calm and eloquence that seemed to inspire hope for the future. This student was Josiane Mumukunde Alix. We were all students connected by a common interest in global health and seeking out the realities of others. Our worlds are shaped by our lived experiences and the narratives we tell about them. We all understand disease through the paradigm of our culture and the stories we create about our experiences. In fact, we are hardwired for a story, both biologically and socially. Stories are a powerful way to share knowledge, evoke emotion, create trust, and ignite action. They are the medium through which we teach, entertain and express ourselves, gather and share a sense of belonging. Listening to a story activates multiple areas of the brain, which allows us to not only process the experience for ourselves, but to share emotions as we synchronize with the storyteller's brain. Stories transcend statistics and numbers, break down the barriers that keep us from connecting to each other's realities, and help us recognize the biases and false narratives that we create. Stories are the entry point to understanding health in a context that goes beyond biology and medicine. They remind us that human lives are fragile and delicately balanced. When one thing is off, that perfect balance is dismantled. Healthcare professionals play a crucial role in restoring that, whether it be physically, mentally, or emotionally. So each person can, can continue to write their story and let others learn from it. Each person deserves to tell their story and have it heard, and it shouldn't be defined by someone's zip code. During our social documentary and theory and practice course this past fall, Sahil and I were presented with the task of creating a short film on a social issue of importance to us. When provided this opportunity, we knew we couldn't pass up the chance to further explore Josiane's story, which so deeply moved us. Our documentary is entitled Quizera, a story of hope born from resilience. Quizera comes from the Kenya Rwanda word for hope, which tells the trying story of Josiane as a Rwandan refugee her journey to pursue an education against all odds, and her efforts to equip the next generation of Rwandans with the tools needed to succeed and move beyond their past. This story is one of hope, resilience, inspiration, and love. Chimimanda Adishi, a Nigerian novelist, warns that the single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. In capturing Josiane's story, we hope to be a part of the process of rewriting the dominant narratives surrounding refugees to show that they're not defined by their trauma, but by their resilience, perseverance, and hope for a better future. Stories allow us to not only receive information, but to better understand both our own lives and the lives of those surrounding us. We urge you to look around the room, to the person to your left and to the person to your right. Each one of you has a unique story that has shaped you and who you are today your thoughts, ideas, and perspectives. We encourage you to take that leap and be vulnerable with one another, both today and in the future, to listen to each other's stories, for you never know what you may uncover. We hope that hearing Josiane's story will spark something inside of you, just like it did for us. We're so thankful to Josiane for intimately welcoming us into her life 
and allowing us to share a piece of her with all of you. And to the Global Health Symposium Organizing Committee for providing us with the platform to do so. Without further ado, we'd like to present to you Kusera, the story of hope born from resilience. Talk about winning it out of the right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. It is such an, an honor and joy to be here with you uh, this morning, to be surrounded by people I admire so deeply, many of whom I'm lucky to have, um, not only as friends, but also as mentors. Um, I want to give a profound thank you um, to Sahil, Kate, um, and the Yukon Global Health uh, Community, uh, the symposium pretty much organizers, for giving me the opportunity to tell my story. Because it's a privilege many others um, that share experiences like mine, that they, you know, it's a, a privilege that they do not have. And any of us have um, had similar experiences I know of us could have similar experiences if we had uh, the misfortune to be born at the wrong place or wrong time. There's a principle in life. What drives our passion can often be rooted in our early experiences. For me, sharing my, sharing my story helps me rise above painful memories and contemplate how those experiences can be utilized to create good. Today, I want to share more of my experiences with you, how those experiences have shaped my perspective and passion, and how past experiences can lead to a real positive, uh, to a real positive change, or a desire to give back or, or make a difference. As you just saw in the documentary, my story begins in Rwanda, a small country located in East Africa. Before the genocide, even though my parents did not have a lot of money, our lives were peaceful. My mother worked at a local secondary school. My father worked at a local secondary school library. My mother, being first in her family, was forced to drop out of high school to find work as a secretary and help feed her six younger siblings. Before the conflict, my days consisted of ordinary childhood experiences, play outside, crime trees, and rough. During school breaks, I visited my grandparents who lived in a small village an hour away. I would sit, I would, I would just sit and watch cows graze the green grass and pray in the fields overlooking spectacular mountain views. Like many 12 year old, I had never given much thought to the concept of death or to the possibility of what might mean to lose people close to me. That all changed on the morning of April 6, 1994. I woke up among other Rwandans what would be the beginning of a terrible act of genocide. During the intervening months, many of my neighbors, friends, and family members were killed. In 100 days, nearly 1 million lives were lost, and 2 million people were, were driven from their homes while the world looked away. After months of living in paralyzing fear, my parents, my two siblings, and I started our attempt to escape Rwanda, the home I loved. We fled on foot, taking only what we could carry in our hands. We walked day and night for almost three months in the bush and forest, hiding, never knowing how much danger we were in. During, during our dangerous journey, one of the three stones used to secure our makeshift, makeshift fireplace tipped over. My sister, 17 year old at that time, was in the way of the path of hard water and the water fell into her entire left foot. Without treatment, the wound became infected 
and the whole leg began to swell. We could not travel any further. Luckily, a kind stranger gave us a tube of antibiotic cream he had in his bag. Eventually, my sister's wound healed and we continued our, our journey to reach the neighboring country of Congo. Upon our arrival, I soon realized that the refugee camp was not what I had imagined it to be. The living condition defy imagination. Before I go any further, I invite you to close your eyes and envision what your health would be like if you woke up tomorrow in the following place. Picture a press Picture a place where thousands of tents, sometimes not tall enough to stand without hitting your head, are closely spaced next to one another. Each tent is baking in the sun day after day like a sauna. The sky is full of smoke from the cooking done outside. No electricity, no running water, no schools. You are not allowed you are not allowed to traveling outside the camp boundaries to study or look for work. Basic necessities such as a bathroom or medicine are hard to find. You go to sleep hungry and you wake up hungry. When the food finally arrives, you storm the tracks along with hundreds of others, waiting in long lines to receive a portion of Ibishimbo and the Bigori beans and cornmeal as it is known in my native language, Kinyarwanda. Portions are given out based on the number of people are uh, on the number of people in your family. There is never enough. You watched you watch newborn newborn abandoned, loved ones succumb to preventable and treatable diseases. For me, this means to remember my little brother Patrick, who died in one of the camps due to something as, as simple as not having clean water. You yourself become numb, oblivious to what may happen next. Although days follow, although days follow one another, you can't plan anything because you do not know whether you want them to go by quickly or just stop altogether. If you are weak, you will lose hope. So, you grow up fast and learn to create normal from the abnormal. You rise early in the morning to beat the water line. You sell tea and bread on the side of the road just to make a living. You gather leaves and twigs to cover the dusty ground where you sleep, only to see that each heavy rainfall washes everything away. But, there is no time for self-pity, so you move on with life and build again. Please open your eyes. This was my life before. This isn't my life anymore. A lot have changed in 25 years. And I remain grateful to those who have made my life and my good health possible. But, it's not difficult to consider what might have happened if I had stayed in those surroundings much longer. Ladies and gentlemen, the direct impact on physical and mental health must not be underestimated. I could have lost my life like, like far too many others, or my future could have been very dark. Right now, Displaced children with no future prospect, prospects of a job or schooling are far more likely to turn to violence. Life has a funny way to bring you back to your roots. In March of 2018, I traveled back to Rwanda just to visit relatives. Then one morning, as I was sitting on the patio, I noticed a little boy wearing an oversized t-shirt with no pants and no shoes. He was 
he was with another boy and a girl who were not mad, who were not much older. I asked the neighbors who they were, and they told me the kids were local children who lived 30 minutes away. I asked her if they saw the children again to please notify me. Within an hour, the children were back, and I asked them, and I asked the children if they could introduce me to their parents. Upon arrival at their home, built from stick and mud, I met their parents. Eventually, I was told that Quizera had not yet started, started first grade and that he was already a year behind. His parents did not have the finances to send all three of their children to school at the same time. I asked how much tuition was. The father informed me that it was 8,100 francs, which works out to be AUS dollars uh, each semester. Members of, to make the matters worse, members of this family also had a life-threatening disease and could not afford to pay healthcare coverage, which uh, in Rwanda cost one dollar a person per year. This lit a fire in my soul. It took me 25 years to get to a point to have access to the resources and opportunities to live happier, healthier life, and I'm very fortunate. But education and health cannot wait. I didn't want 25 years for others, for Quizera, to, to be offered the opportunity of a brighter future. I don't want another child's future destroyed forever. A person's chance in life to reach their full potential should not be determined by a birth lottery. It should be determined by their access to quality education, to health care, and to employment. It is because of these fundamental human rights that I strongly believe we need to take action now. We need to find solutions that are not time bound. The great Maya Angel once said, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Although my story is singular, there are 65 million forcibly displaced people around the world in the same situation as I was, as I once was in. That's roughly the population of France. I'm here to represent Quizera and millions of people around the world who, by the lottery of birth, lack opportunities, resources to allow them to explore, discover, and develop their interests. I'm here to represent those raised in an environment that do not give them safety, love, food, hope, education, and access to health care, simply because of where that person was born. There are real people behind the statistics. Mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters. All with hopes and dreams that are senseless being shattered and denied the chance to show the world what they could do. From all my experiences so far, what I ultimately have learned is that each of each of us is responsible for making the world a better place, and this can be done simply by being attentive to the needs around us. Small gesture can make a huge difference. Compassion and empathy of strangers saved my sister and I. Traditional charities and aid alone are not going to solve all problems. Some require political solutions. However, governments can always resolve every issue. They don't have the time or they may lack political will. But the youth, but the youth have the time and the will. I feel that we have the ability and the space to design and solve all kinds of problems creatively, such as those facing developing countries. Together, we can design multidisciplinary multi solutions on, on multiple levels to help others in need to have a better condition, 
a better, to help others in need to have better conditions, better education, and better health. With the united force of people sitting up here, we, as engaged citizens, as academ academia, as the next generation of leaders, can make a considered effort to address these issues. I know in this room there is compassion and the willingness to do the right thing. We just need to engage each other to step forward. You have a role to play. I have a role to play. Meeting those three young children and learning about their family, I decided to act. Firstly, because of the years I spent with our formal education, I wanted to make sure there is education for every child. Secondly, because strangers who helped my family were trying to flee the conflict, instilled one simple but profound moral lesson. We are not here on this earth primarily and only to save, our, to save ourselves. We have an obligation to give back and save others. Today, Quizera, today Quizera and his siblings are in school. And the family runs a small business and lives in a house with electricity. The journey of how we ended up helping this family is a story about hope, which translates to Quizera in Rwandan language. This is the story that I wish we all can recreate for other families in need. It is not an attainable dream, but it's a reality that can be brought up about, provided, of course, that each of us be willing to take action. I urge all of you to step up. You have, on countries many times before, had goals and stepped up to achieve a great deal. It's time to do it again. My message to you and my ask to you is in 40 or 50 years from now, when you look back or when your children look back at what we did and how we acted, we will be proud that not only we acted but also that we did the right thing. We will, we will look back at our reaction to the current issues with pride. How will the lens of history judge us? For me, I owe it to the quizzers of the world, and just as much as, and just as important, I owe it to myself. Thank you for listening. Yes. Do you still spend time working um, in Rwanda as well as in the States? I'm sorry, Do you spend time working in Rwanda as well as in the US? Um, so that was when I went back last year. It was my first time going back. Okay. You may wonder, maybe asking yourself why, why wait so long. Um, but I, I wasn't ready to go back. But also, I didn't just want to go back. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, yes. So when I um, last year was my first time going back. But uh, I waited, like you may ask, you ask yourself, why did I wait that long? But um, I wasn't able to go back. And also, I didn't want just to go back. I wanted, I wanted to go, uh, even though I have relatives there, but I wanted also to go and um, do something. So yes, I'm hoping that in the future, I can uh, spend more time there. Um, so when I, after that, I went, the first time I went there, um, and met the kids and a family. It was during spring break last year. Mm -hmm. Then I came back that week. Um, then that, uh, in June, I went back to check on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping to go again this summer. Thank you for your question. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for listening. Is there any organization right now on the ground that's so helping the people that you met when you were there? Yes. Um, so, What, I, what we did, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I, because it, many people helped me to do this. Uh, when I came back, I created a Google fund, and my, my, my classmates, my friends, we all pitched in, and, and uh, 
and raise the money. And what we did, uh, I thought like it was just a small um, gesture, but at the same time, it's not sustainable. Okay, the kids are in school, the children, um, they are in school, but also, it's how is how are they going to learn if they don't have food? How are they going to learn if, uh, if, if, if they are sick? And things like that. How are they going to learn if they are sleeping on the ground? Um, so what, uh, what, I, what I tried to do was um, to uh, give um, like their parents a small loan, and so they can like, start a small business and be able to uh, at least uh, like, get an income. But there's also other organizations in Rwanda and that they are, they are connected with. So that's good. And um, um, what, 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 I mean, that's the next thing that we are going to, um, I'm, I'm actually like looking into it to see if I can uh, have the mother like, take a training, like a vocation training or a business course. That way um, they can be able to sustain themselves. But there's, there, there are some other organizations that, that they are connected with. Thank you. Yeah. So we had a question in the back. Okay. Um, I'm going to break this back. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, next one. Back here. Wow, this is a really good one. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your talk. And unfortunately, I didn't hear the last question, so it might be kind of related to it. But um, do you have like a reliable connection? Um, and like in Rwanda so that we could, like we as students can contribute and help other Quizeras like in the areas. It's, it's so unbelievably like cheap to, to help these people. Um, Eight dollars for a semester and one dollar for health. Everybody can afford that. Like everybody in this room should be able to fund a child's education for a year and health care for a year. And I was wondering if like you could give us a connection so that we could help other people. Um. Yes, actually, so there's so many organizations that work in Rwanda. Um, I don't have one in particular, but something I can look into it. Yeah, yes. thank you. Jersey, do you have like a funding link or something that people that are like poor attending who want to contribute can yes. donate or, okay. or help out in any way? That's because you are obviously so committed to this and you go back to Rwanda and you make sure this money is being used for your child. Uh, is there a way that we yeah, yes, actually, I should mention this. Um, in, on, in the, like, coming, coming up soon, like, at the month of April, I'm going to be doing a fundraising, uh, like, on GoFunds and trying to raise money. Um, that way, we, I, I can make sure that the, not only the kids are in school, but also, like, the parents are able to keep their business going. So I'm going to, I don't have any like uh, link right now, but it's something that I'm working on and I'm hoping to launch it by the beginning of April. So if you follow um, our symposium on Twitter and Instagram, we will provide that link. So if you're interested in, in uh, contributing to Josiane's work and helping with this vision, um, that would be incredible. I mean, just think about the impact of just each of us contributing a dollar yes. would go towards Funding so many Rwandans in their health care. Uh, okay, so opening the floor again to questions. Thank you so much. All right, here you go. <laughs> thank you. Oh. Um, thank you, Josie, and thank you for being so awesome. Um, on a personal level, what advice can you give somebody that wants to do something that, in a way, would help or better the world, but they have no idea of how they could initiate. Wow. <laughs> how would you advise somebody that would just want to do something like you, that you were so inspired to do good for others? Okay, yes, that's a really great question. Um, I would say, I, I have this, I carry this philosophy that just more attentiveness to the needs are does. It doesn't have, you, you know, I'm not saying go and we can't, there's no way to press a button and mandate change right away, you know, like everything starts in small, in small, um, especially in small steps. So even if you just uh, start by raising awareness, you know, igniting the conversation, 
or even if you, or you just start by, for example, uh, working with a local organization, um, educating yourself about issues that, you know, that are happening in your communities, uh, things like that, like what's happening out, around you, like what are the stories of the people you are connected with, you know. So that could be uh, I, I, the best way I can say to study. And also, we often think like that if you want to change the world, you have to, you know, like to start off big. You don't have to start off big. Like small, just changing one person's life, like making sure someone doesn't go to sleep hungry that night, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be something large. You can just start by educating yourself about issues in your neighborhood, then move on from there. Thank you. Once again, you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you.